even you know three four years ago when rates were down we still insisted that we get upside and then we because we manage our own stuff i mean we when we execute that upside we do it as fast as we can which is and we manage our debt because i went through 0809 i know what happens when debt freezes up and interest rates change and I, I just i know what that's like so we between our ability to force appreciation quickly and just make sure that we were managing our debt so that we didn't have variable interest rate risk we were able to be fine hey there i am dr jason ballara and this is the know your why podcast where we explore the why behind success every week i meet with real estate investors veterinary entrepreneurs mindset coaches authors and fitness professionals to uncover their why and how it drives them on the winding road to success. What is your why? Hi everyone, I'm Jason Ballara and this is the Know Your Why podcast. Today I'm here with Ken Gee. Ken is the founder and managing member of KRI Partners, a real estate, private equity and investor education form, firm. He's got more than 26 years of real estate experience. And I think uh, talking about that experience is going to sound a lot better coming from your mouth than mine. So first, Ken, I'm just going to say thank you so much for coming on the show today. Um, really excited to, to, to chat. Well, thank you so much for having me. Very, very happy to be here. Very happy to be here. So awesome. yeah, my background, uh, I'll be brief. It, I grew up in Toledo, Ohio. Probably nobody's ever heard of it. Um, if you watch MASH, that would be the only way you would know where Toledo, Ohio is back in the day. I uh, got my undergrad University of Toledo, um, moved to Cleveland, became a commercial lender, went to school at night, got my master's from Case Western Reserve University. That was when I decided I wanted to be a CPA. I got tired as a, as a lender of listening to all my clients tell me they had to talk to their CPA before they did anything. I wanted to be <laughs> that guy. So yeah. uh, I became a CPA, worked for Deloitte for seven years on the tax side. Um, lots of fun, lots of cool stuff that, uh, you know, on the tax side is more fun, I always felt, than the audit side. Uh, but it was there that I decided that uh, I wanted to get into real estate. I was, you know, my kids were, I mean, this is a long time ago. So my kids were, my daughter was an infant. I used to do her 3 a.m. feeding, right, during busy season <laughs> at, at Deloitte. Um, yeah. And I thought that was cool at first because it was just me and her and everybody's asleep. And, you know, that's a whole bonding thing going on yeah. there. Yeah, And then I realized, wait a minute, you dummy, it's three o'clock in the morning and this is the best you're going to do with your daughter. Like that, that didn't sit well with me. And, yeah. uh, you know, I thought I did everything right. Went to school, got good grades, you know, did everything I was supposed to do. Thought I was set. And then I realized, wait a minute, I just, I just set myself up so I don't get to watch my family grow up. And that, that wasn't cool. So that's what got me into real estate. And uh, I haven't looked back since. Yeah. Yeah. Kids will do that to you. Same, same, uh, sort of a <laughs> transformative moment for me too. When, when, uh, my kid, my son, before our daughter was born, even my son was young and it was just like, I was just working all the time, which was fine. Before that, my wife tolerated it. I guess she understood she was, uh, yeah. you know, when it was just her and I like, wasn't that big of a deal. And then when there was a kid, like, well, just like I said, like, I don't, I don't want to only see them for, you know, yeah. 30 minutes a day, whatever. Like I, I want to right. be, I want to be a part of their life that, you know, they remember and the, like that, that, you know, and, and so, yeah, that was, that was actually what really kind of pushed me into getting more heavily into real estate uh, in, in just like freeing up time basically. So mm -hmm. when you decided to, to take that that leap, make that change. I mean, yeah. what did that look like at first for you? I mean, getting into real estate is kind of a really broad, <laughs> broad yeah. term in the yeah. sense that, you know, there's a million different avenues to, to get into real estate. So what, what did you do? You had been a lender, you'd been a CPA, the numbers side yeah. of it was, was clearly um, uh, in your wheelhouse, but, but what did you start with? Yeah. So well, what happened when I was at Deloitte, uh, I, the, the practice, the Cleveland practice, office at Deloitte had a massive real estate practice, like Zaremba, Developers Diversified, Jacobs, lots of really, really big real estate people. So real estate wasn't that foreign to me. I didn't do a lot in real estate while I was in right. a CPA. But uh, so what, what happened was I spent about a year and a half trying to figure out the business, right? Because yeah, you think, oh, you're a CPA, you know numbers. CPAs, they don't know anything about real estate. They don't, 
they don't know how much it's supposed to cost to do this and to do that. They just yeah. know how to put yeah. numbers together. So uh, I spent about a year and a half trying to network, trying to learn the business. Back then, the only thing that was available was Carlton Sheets, if you, you may or may not remember that name. But uh, I, I figured I it know out. the name because people talk about it, but I don't, I don't think I ever uh, got any ex exposure to Carlton Sheets. <laughs> yeah, he was he was the guy the the eleven thirty p.m. infomercial yeah. selling the no no down payment program, and and it was all single family houses. But I mean that that was my training. It was it was terrible training for multifamily. So I but but what happened? I was at Deloitte, and I thought, man, I don't want to buy a single family. I don't want to buy. I just because I, I can't I can't fix things. There's no way I could imagine myself having time to go fix things at the property. So I said, I got to buy something bigger. And I thought, okay, well, I found a 28-unit property that I actually bought from probably one of the nicest guys on the planet. He now owns over 10,000 units. Um, it was his very first building. So he sold it to me, a super fair guy. I mean, he could have taken me to the cleaners probably because I didn't <laughs> know anything. But yeah. he was a very fair guy. He took a note back for 10%. I borrowed my down payment. I got the other half from my in-laws who were kind enough to say, I'll be your half, 50-50 partner. And so we bought that bill. I bought that building, uh, bought two more buildings. Three years later, we I, I sold them and I made half a million dollars. And I thought, <laughs> what just happened to me? I just made more money on the side than I had the whole entire time I was at Deloitte up until that point. Like yeah. that wasn't supposed to happen, but it did. And that's when I just said, all right, the, you can't ignore this. You've got to stay focused here and do this. So that's really yeah. how I got it started. It was small building, 28 unit, 24 was number two, and 22 was number three. Yeah. And the, were those local to you? They were. Yeah. Cleveland, yeah. it's a small, if anybody's familiar with Cleveland, it's a small neighborhood called Shaker Square. And I bought, uh, you know, I bought the first one. I thought, man, this is cool. And then I called everybody on the street, like nonstop, <laughs> getting them to sell. I finally got a couple more to sell. Yeah. So, and what was the um, like time frame? What what years were you starting that process? Nineteen ninety-seven. Ninety-seven. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, I think long time ago. The it, well, at, at least. To me, I have experienced two significant, you know, real estate market shifts in 2008 and now, basically now. Yeah. Um, so I'm always, I, I like to kind of understand in relation to some of those things, you know, wh where people, um, what that experience has been going through those. So you started with those, I mean, and I think, and interestingly, you know, you, you said you started small, but you also said, oh, I wasn't going to do single family. You know, everybody has a different concept yeah. in their mind of what's what's big well like i'm sure a lot of people would think oh well you had you know 80 90 units in in those first few years like that's a lot and mm -hmm. and it is and so talk about some of the reasons why you chose to go yeah. that route because everybody has their idea of like i go <laughs> i do real estate in this lane because of this but i think that yeah. like it's easy to get caught up in, you know, well, this person says it should be this way. This person says it should be that way. And I think people sometimes lose sight of what, you know, they sh what they should do is what works for them. So how That's did right. you decide and kind of come to that conclusion of what worked for you then? Yeah, that's a really good question. Well, when I was at Deloitte, I, the thought of me having time to fix something, go on the weekend and turn a unit or do whatever, it just was, I just couldn't imagine. Plus, I, I don't know how to fix anything. I didn't have time and I didn't know how to do it. So I felt like I had to have something big enough that I could run like a quote unquote business. That was what right. I felt like, right? So uh, 28 units, I, that's not big, but I did find a lady and I thought, okay, I can get someone to work there part-time and give her a unit and some money and she can show the apartments and help me coordinate maintenance. And that's exactly yeah. what she did. Now, as it turned out, she stayed with me and grew with me for the first three buildings right but that's that's what i did and that's why i did it that way because i needed something that i could delegate things to and run it like a business because i literally work from you know seven in the morning until nine ten eleven o'clock at night at deloitte so there was no extra time to do anything plus i actually wanted to see my family right so that was the main reason the biggest lesson though that that those early buildings taught me and it has an impact on me even today is 
I didn't understand the when I bought my first building, I didn't really understand how I was going to make money. I, I just thought, okay, I'll buy it. It'll go up in value. But I didn't really understand why. I, you would think an accountant would know all that stuff, but I didn't. Yeah. That's just the way it yeah. is. So I learned the concept. I had this lady named, her name was Karen uh, from Shaker Heights. And she she said, Ken, uh, you know, well, what happened to me? Well, let me back up. What happened to me was as soon as I bought the property, I knew a little bit about credit. So I'm looking at the applications she would get and they were terrible credit. They didn't have good jobs. And I thought, oh man, I'm toast. Like I'm screwed. How am I going to fill this building with good people? So somehow I ran into this lady. I don't remember why or how I ran into her, but she said, Ken, your your sinks and kitchens are from the 1930s when the building was built. Like you got to upgrade, man. I mean, this, this was the nineties, right? I mean, you, you yeah, got to yeah. make some changes here. Yeah. So I thought she said, spend five grand in there and put in a new kitchen and sand the floors and they will come. And I told her, I said, you're nuts. I said, I don't have any money left. I just spent every penny I had. She goes, I'm just telling you, you need to do it. I said, okay. So I put them up, put it on my credit card and I did it. I did exactly what she told me to do. Yeah. So our rents when I bought the property were four fifteen. <laughs> as soon as I did that, the rents were five ninety nine, and good people showed up to rent the apartment. Yeah. I thought, oh my God, thank God. So I understood. I learned the hard way the value of or the the concept of value add. And now fast forward twenty seven years later, you know that that concept has always stuck with me. I know it seems kind of basic, but when you're in the middle of it and you don't understand it, it's, it's a big deal. Yeah. Every deal we do, we make sure there's some sort of upside component to it, right? We just don't buy and say, okay, well, we'll hold for 20 years and it'll probably be worth more. It's way more intentional. Now. Yeah, no, I think forcing appreciation is just so much more powerful than, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sort of waiting for the market to do. And I mean, like, again, I mentioned, you know, sort of the different market cycles. There's been some times that you didn't have to force appreciation because the market did, you know, did you a favor. But realistically, it does make much more sense to be uh, controlling that and in, in, in finding mm -hmm. an asset that you can do something to improve, whether that's, you know, physical construction type projects or management type, um, you know, mm -hmm. improvements. The, the value add strategy, it, it almost becomes more powerful when the market is down because now you know you, you you're not going to necessarily get you know three four hundred dollars more a month but you can if you just because the market says that you're you're going to have to make improvements like you did with that to, to kind of justify mm -hmm. your your rental increases so it's yeah. um yeah it's a it's a great concept so where did where did your journey go from there? You said you yeah. had those three, you sold them, you made you made great money. You thought, oh, mm -hmm. this is this makes a lot of sense. So um <laughs> carry us forward a little bit there. Yeah. So for the first ten years, I just did deals in Cleveland. Um, small deals like that. And about ten we didn't have anybody I didn't use anybody else's money. I had a partner, right? Early on I didn't have any money really. I, I didn't. I didn't have a balance sheet, and as you know, it helps to have somebody on your partner team with money, balance right. sheet, experience. So I found this attorney at one of the apartment association meetings. His name is Gary. Fantastic guy. I'm indebted to him. You know, I'm uh, thankful to him even to this day that he helped me get started. And we did a number of deals together. We made a lot of money together. And then about 15 years ago, I thought, man, we're doing okay in Cleveland. And it's not, no, there are not a lot of people moving to Cleveland. They, nobody looks forward to that, right? Or not most people. What yeah. if we did this in a market where everybody wanted to live? Like, what would happen? And I, th I thought it would be awesome. Well, I wasn't wrong. I spent a lot of time going to Florida. That's why we do everything in Florida. Not everything, but we're in Florida right now. We yeah. suddenly got to experience a, a very different demand supply setup. And as you know, Florida, everybody wants to be in Florida. And so we, I mean, then our, our, our entire um business just took off, right? I, it's my business. Gary's now retired. We do still have one deal together. But w when we came to Florida, we started syndicating because the, it cost a lot more to buy in, or in uh, Florida. So we yeah. started syndicating. Then that got hard because now, I mean, there's 40 syndicators trying to get one deal. How do you yeah. set yourself apart? I mean, now it just becomes a bidding war and that's hard. I mean, we did okay doing that. 
So what we did is remember my experience at Deloitte, I did a lot of M&A work, a lot of private equity work. So I understood that blind pool fund model. And I said, well, we need to flip this around. We can't find the deal, then raise the money in 45 days. That is just massively stressful. And I can't differentiate myself. I said, why don't we, I, I should go raise the money first and then use that strong buyer, right? I got the money in the bank to go get yeah. better deals. We did that a number of years ago, and uh, it obviously it worked really, really well. We're on fund number four, and uh, this fund is probably going to close at twenty million. So we're you know we're we continue to to grow up. We like small funds, fifteen to twenty million each, and just keep rolling fund to fund to fund. So that's kind of how we grew up. But I will tell you, we have always held on to this value add concept. So mm-hmm. even you know three four years ago, when rates were down we still insisted that we get upside and then we because we manage our own stuff i mean we when we execute that upside we do it as fast as we can which is and we manage our debt because i went through 0809 i know what happens when debt freezes up and interest rates change and i just i know what that's like so we between our ability to force appreciation quickly and just make sure that we were managing our debt so that we didn't have variable interest rate risk we were able to be fine, right? So mm-hmm. I back in 08, back in 97, well, I'll say 2000, because I'm not going to take credit for doing it in 97. That happened by accident. But 2000 on, every single time that we insisted on having value, and, you know, something's going to go sideways on you on a deal. They just does. Like some expense you didn't plan on, something's going to happen. But yeah. what always bails you out? That new cash flow every single time. So that's why we insisted we, I just always insist on even leverage as close to it as we can get, and then two to three hundred and upside. Even today, uh, we just closed on a deal in March, a brand new deal out of lease up, and uh, it's got two hundred bucks in upside. And we're getting what we expected to get, right? Everybody says, "Well, markets are flat. How could you get that?" Well, because somebody was leasing it under market. They just were. That's what yeah. builders do. They want to lease up quickly. So my point is that that strategy is. You got to stay disciplined to do it, but you got to do it through all cycles because it's what saves you when things uh, get a little difficult for a while. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, I want to touch on, you, you know, you mentioned kind of the debt structure and, and what you, um, you prioritizing that. And I think having, uh, I have not been syndicating nearly as long as you, I've, I've but I found out very quickly how important the debt structure is. And yeah. so I, I wanted to, maybe just ask you to kind of expand on that and what yeah. what your criteria are as far as what you're looking for debt I, I think i think you know right now of course everybody's like it should be it should be fixed rate debt because adjustable debt floating debt got people in trouble i think that it's not as cut and dry as that and then there are other pieces that go into it but, but what are yeah. you looking for in terms of your you know debt structuring on your deals yeah so the first thing we try not to do well we don't do is over leverage we just don't over leverage because that'll get you in trouble every single time. Number one. Number two, uh, remember three or four years ago, most everyone said rates cannot go up. It's not possible. The government would be bankrupt because they couldn't afford it. It's just not going to happen. Well, I, I've never subscribed to any theory that I know what's going to happen, especially with something like that. Now, yeah. nobody predicted 5% in 12 months. Right. I mean, that's just crazy. Right. but. What is important is when I go into a deal, I know that I can live with the debt that I have. I give myself as much flexibility as I can, right? Because part of me doesn't want to get held into a deal longer than I want because I put too long a debt on it. But Mm -hmm. the other part of me says, well, no, I don't want too short a debt either because then I have to refinance. And guess that's how everybody in 08 had a problem. Their maturity came up at the wrong time and nobody would take them out. So they had to give their buildings back. So I like seven-year debt. That's just what I like at about 65%. And some would say, well, that's an awful long time. Well, if you can cash flow there, your rent should go up because you that's part of your business plan. And then, so here's the thing. They think they're locked in, but you're not. Because with most Fannie Freddie, when you go out that far, you can do supplementals after a year or two. So now that you can still sell the property, the new buyer can put a loan, uh, like it's kind of like a second, but that's not really what it is. 
put a mm-hmm. second mortgage on top of the first, and you're able to sell the building and not deal with the prepayment penalty. So I just try to give myself as many options as I can. Um, but what what people are in trouble now is because they thought, okay, I'm going to get bridge debt. That's fine, but it's going to be three years and I'm going to be out. So that's what I'm going to set up. I'm going to set up my rate cap for three years and then I'll be out because it won't matter what happens after that. And who thought rates were going up anyway? Those are the people that got in trouble, yeah. right? Because they yeah. they really, it, in a perfect world, you should match the term of your debt to your business plan, but the world is never, ever perfect. <laughs> so you just, you've got to allow for that. Uh, that extension, that whatever, right? You got to make sure that you can still deal with that. And if you weren't able to execute on your business plan, which is what else happened to a lot of people, especially they didn't have a lot of experience, they'd hire third-party management. The management wouldn't be so good, so they couldn't execute on the business plan. So now they can't refinance their way out of it because the rent didn't go up enough. You see that. So when you start to get this little perfect storm, debt right. mismanagement a little bit and management uh, business execution problems, that's when the biggest problems are happening right now. Yeah. At least that's what I see. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And you're, so, I mean, you've been through a couple of these cycles and obviously have a, a, a great perspective and it's like, well, this is, is going to be a two-part question. So so one, you say you like to stay around 65% leverage, you, you know, mm-hmm. seven-year term in, you know, prior to 2022, I thought what is something like 70 or 80 percent of all loans were were bridge debt. Like it was like a, mm-hmm. a crazy, um, you know, shift in that direction because the market was so hot, and it was like that was the only way you could actually finance and and make the deals work for investors and things like that. What did you right. do during that time? I mean, did you did you sit on the sidelines? Did you were you still able to find things that fit your criteria? What was yeah. What was your strategy in, in that, you know, scenario? Yeah. That No, that's a really good question. So I think, let me just look at the deals that we did then. The first deal we did in in one of our funds, we did put bridge debt on it. I knew that I was going to move income very fast. Literally within 11 months, we flipped it to a 65% seven-year loan at 528, I think it was, right? I just I just saw what was starting to happen. And remember, what did I say? This 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 upside in rents, you got to get it quick, and if you do, you'll you'll it'll save you, and it it did. So yeah. we flipped that to seven year debt. The second deal, what did we put? We put five year debt on it, fixed. I think it was under four, mm-hmm. and then the third yeah. deal, we have five year debt, and that was just under six. So what I did was five year debt. So yeah. I think we're two years into most of that. We still have three years left, and uh, let's see. So then the first one flipped into a seven year. I did a refinance like a year and a half ago and pulled a deal out of we had had for a while, but I put seven year debt at that, you know, at five sixty eight or something. And, and some would say, "Oh, why did you do that then?" It, we're fine. It's cash flows. It's fine. Right. And if we want to sell it, we still can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's yeah, what you- I did. I just tried to put longer term debt. Did we miss a lot of deals? <laughs> yes. Yeah, because there are a lot of people that would be willing to be way more aggressive than us. And you just have to let them do it. You, you know, most of those guys probably were sorry they did it. But uh, yeah. you, you, it's it's really hard to not get FOMO when that's happening. But 27 years, I, I just I just refuse yeah. to get it. I just won't do it. And if investors get frustrated with us, we just tell them that they should go on. I mean, we're just that's what you pay us for. You pay us to do good deals, not deals. Right. Right. And yeah. So no, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> it's hard to hold up against that, though. Yeah, I, I think I, I mean, I you know, you've got you've been doing it for long enough that, you know, your track record sort of supports your investors being patient in those times and that, you know, mm-hmm. what you're doing. You said um, something earlier. You said, you know, we we manage everything. Are you are you vertically integrated in your property management and construction management as well? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we use outside <laughs> in the, on the construction side. We'll use outside contractors for the big stuff like roofs and parking lots and things like okay. that. Um, unit turns, renovations, uh, other than flooring. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll outsource painting, but it, most of that, I mean, those are just, in our world, that's just, those are just hard unit turns. That's right. all, because right. it's, it's pretty basic. But our we've done some third-party management. Our senior management team's managed about 16,000 units. So at this point in the game, it's hard to find someone who will care as much as us 
and has as much experience. That's just it. It just seems like an overwhelming task. So we've we're we're going to stay self managing for so many different reasons. And uh, I personally think that we, you know it's really contributed to our success. Yeah, I, that's when did you make that? I mean, or did you start? Were you self managing from the beginning, yeah. or, or when did you make that choice. switch? I didn't have it. It was no switch. Remember, I started in Cleveland. Yeah. Yeah. There are not a lot of people who invest in Cleveland from outside of Cleveland. So because of that, the third party management world never it never grew up in Cleveland. Okay. It just there was no need. So it was an owner operator town. So I started from day one figuring out how to manage my own stuff, right? And so yeah. after ten years, then we went to Florida and you know, at, at first we had to have another because the, the agencies wouldn't let you <laughs> manage right. from afar. Right. So we had to have a couple management companies in name only really be in front of us, and they got paid really to do nothing. Um, but the the real challenge with third party managers, and, it, and I, I have no problem with it. We did it for a while. We don't do it anymore. Yeah. We're 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 kind of done with that. But what happens when you have a third party manager? Is remember, they're a vendor, and they don't want to give you a reason to get rid of them. So what happens is there's suddenly this. What you want is information to flow from the bottom to the top. So you can literally solve problems the right way. But when you put it, sometimes, I'm not saying everybody does this, but a lot of times when that third party manager is there, what you hear gets filtered through somebody at that third party management firm. And it's very hard to even talk to the manager. I would show up when we did, you know, when, when we did have that third party there just in name. They didn't like it, but I, I wasn't going to talk to the regional manager of the property manager. I want, I, I'm going to deal directly with the leasing person and the manager and the maintenance guy, right? Yeah. Because that's the only way to find out what's really going on. So that's what I would just caution people in the third-party management world. Plus, it, it's, I mean, you're just not going to get someone caring about your property as much as you do. Because they yeah. don't get this big upside if you're successful. You do, <laughs> right? right? So we're, that's why we do it. It's been really, really successful for us. And uh, yeah. And again, th- that's not to mean that there aren't good third party managers because there are. It's just a very, very tough business. Yeah. And I mean, that is that is a really great point. It is a very tough business, like whether you're vertically integrated or you're a third party management, like property management, I think is. is I don't know if it's the hardest business, but it, there there is a lot <laughs> that, that really, yeah, there that goes yeah. into it. And it's like even. I mean, I don't think. Yeah, I, I don't think I had quite realized just how many challenges that, like, and it, even that 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 leasing manager, like that person that's in the office every day, they're just so much that they're you know they're dealing with with trying to get units leased, they're dealing with mm-hmm. delinquent tenants, they're dealing with you know distributing uh, um, uh, maintenance requests, you know, any, any of that stuff, and then and then they're communicating with you know ownership, so it's a um, finding quality people to put in those positions is it, it probably really does make a lot of sense, especially when you're at, at the scale that you are to, to just kind of take out the middleman. And so you have your on-site person and they're just reporting directly to you or, or whoever you have in your own. Right. Right. Our team. Yeah, team. Right. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. yeah I mean, it has a lot to do with also, especially when people are new in the business, the number one disconnection that most people have when they're new in the business is understanding what neighborhoods are really like. And yeah. so what would happen when we were doing third-party management, there would be people who would buy in a fairly tough neighborhood. They didn't understand that it was a tough neighborhood and then be frustrated that we couldn't get a top quality, super talented person to work at that property for $16 an hour. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's just an absurd possibility. I mean, it's just yeah. not going to happen, but it, it, that makes it even harder because now, so usually that person is working at a class A property and right. making, you know, double that, right? And and owners don't usually understand that. So there's a lot of reasons we got out of third party management. That's that's just one of them. Um, mm-hmm. But if it's ma- if your own stuff, you're going to deal with the stuff yourself because you're getting the upside, right? You're getting right. the profits when you sell. Right. And and uh, you're not you know you're not simply just working trading time for money like management property yeah. manager. No, it, it's actually that's actually, I mean, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody put it that way. But the the reality is is that the 
<laughs> the on-site property managers that should make the most money are probably the ones working at the properties that can't afford to pay them the most money. That's like, right. It's mm -hmm. just you, you, because you, you know, your rents are going to be higher in a class A property and all that. Mm -hmm. So, like the what you can afford from a salary standpoint on that property manager is is higher than it would be, you know, would be able to be supported at a you know C or D class property. And then, it, and so, but th that to me, that's just another like great argument for becoming vertically integrated. There is it's like mm -hmm. you're you take away that percentage. That is going to the third property part, you know, third party property management, and then can probably take that revenue and, and you know, then hire someone for a little bit, you know, the yeah. on site person a little bit more. The reality is you pay yourself that money. Right. Yeah. Right. You do yeah. pay it because you're not going to, you can't work for free, right? Because right. you're still, you have all the investors and everything else. Yeah. Um, that's that's uh, the reality of what you do. But it, it's more about what, what happens, ends up happening as you grow up in this business understanding operations those operating problems that you have start to shape the types of properties that you buy mm -hmm. because you understand far more about what it means remember business plan execution is critical if you can't execute on your business plan you are not going to make money most likely you just yeah. won't and so you have to understand what it remember i said people would uh, buy properties in tougher neighborhoods and not even really understand that it how tough that neighborhood really is. Yep. And so in our world, we've seen it. We we know what it looks like. Don't want to do that because we know how hard it is to execute a good business plan. So there's a lot. Yeah. I will tell you the probably when somebody getting into this business and was trying to figure out what to buy, where to buy, sit down and have real honest discussions with third party managers about what it's like in this neighborhood and that neighborhood and so on it, and and really legitimately listen and digest what they say if they're honest with you it'll really really help new investors it will yeah. because it'll make the it'll help them make better decisions yeah yeah and i i don't know if you've seen this as well but i i've noticed that it seems like some of the more um you know I don't know if you want to say reputable, but just the 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 bigger property management yeah. companies, third party company, mm -hmm. they won't they won't take on a property that has you know less than a hundred or one hundred and fifty units. That's a C class. Yeah. Like they they just won't do it. I'm like, mm -hmm. well, that's a that's a good way to make your job easier is by not <laughs> not taking on the the challenging mm -hmm. properties. So it's kind of like it it, it almost um, you know self selects, which which to your point means as a, a buyer, so, you know, someone who wants to be on the ownership side, you really do have to think about, you know, yeah, you might pay a bit more for that, you know, A or B class asset, but it, on a purchase price, but at the end of the day, less headaches, you know, more, uh, more quality property management available to you if you're not vertically integrated. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's a mm -hmm. lot of uh, reasons to say, hey, you might, <laughs> you might be better off, you know, kind of, you know, maybe you, maybe you buy less properties or something. I don't know, but it's. I think it's yeah. uh, getting to that level is. I think where a lot of people end up eventually. Like they they start with the, you know, C and D class because it's a of the price yeah. of entry, but then realize, hey, this is this is probably worth going a little bit higher um, to get something that's less of a headache. That that is exactly what happens as people mature <laughs> in this business. I mean, I've had those tough properties. I know what it's like. We've made money on them. It's not easy. I yep. mean, you're just running ahead of the storm. That's what. That's the best analogy I can make. Is there's a yep. storm behind you, and you're just running to stay ahead of it, right? Yep. And the higher quality asset, it you may feel like there's not as much upside, but there actually is. There actually is. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's you know it's really interesting about multifamily, and I've said this forever. Tell me what other industry, what other business you would start. Hire someone else to run everything associated with it, and you just get a monthly report. Like, think about that a restaurant, a bar, a law firm, an accounting yeah. firm, a manufacturing firm. I mean, there's not one business except right. real estate. Do you do that? I always found that to be interesting about why, because yeah. the like our apartments, they're businesses. Right. I got every single problem that any other business has. Mm -hmm. Every, I, I need to know just as much as they know. I've always found it's just an ironic observation. That why why does it work in this business? I don't know. I don't know. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just in the people who have long-term, you know, success and, and, and longevity in the business it's it's because they're operationally good. Like that's really what, you True. know, like yeah. you're, you're a part of it. True. So it, I think, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. They're, they're, especially again, when like markets are hot, there was a lot of people that get in and they're like, just because it's exciting and everybody's doing yeah. it and let's get on board, but don't necessarily have any operational experience in, right. in real estate or business and, and are just like, I think this seems like a great idea. People are making money and it's a, you know, mm -hmm. it's for as long as that market stays hot, it works. And then, <laughs> and then it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. For a while you, you had a heartbeat, you were making money. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's just the way it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Ken, I, I, I want to, um, kind of shift here and, and make sure I get to ask you the questions I ask every guest before we run out of sure. time. And, and okay. the first one is always um, based on the name of the show being Know Your Why. I, I, I love to ask people, you know, what is your why? You, you've, you've been successful for a long time, um, you know, you're, but you're still, you're still in the game. You're still, uh, yeah. you know, on here talking about it, teaching, um, yeah. you know, sharing your wisdom. So what, what, what is your why? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. 25 years ago, my why was very different. It was my family. It was, I got to make a living. I wanted to make sure that I was with my family. Fast forward, just so you know, you didn't ask this question. I never, I never missed my daughter's basketball games, my son's baseball game. Mission accomplished, right? I'm so happy that I was able to do yeah. that. Yeah. Um, today, my why is very different. And it's actually evolved mostly over the last five years because now my kids are gone, right? So now I got, I got to think about me again. But what I've done is I watch people get into this business and I watch them get into this business um, without really understanding the business. And it pains me because those are the people now, if they weren't careful, they're losing a lot of money. And that's horrible for me. I, I hate that. It didn't have to happen. So my why now, it, our company is structured two ways. If you want to invest in real estate passively, we got the funds and everything for you. If you want to learn the business of real estate, we have an investor education side, and it's it's there to teach people exactly what we do. I give you my underwriting spreadsheet. I give you my due diligence whole pack. I give you everything we do. But the reason I do that is because I I legitimately want you to do well. It is such such a big impact in my life that this is. I mean, I've been doing this twenty seven years. It it's not about the money. It's about helping other people right? And having an impact in other people's lives. 20 years ago, I didn't care about that, right? I only cared about impacting my family. But now it's really, really different. So that's my why now. And, you know, I'm proud to say we're making pretty good headway. Because if people stay disciplined and know the numbers and they do the right things and, and listen to somebody that's been in the business 27 years, they're going to not make the same mistakes I did. They'll be much more, hopefully, much more successful quicker. And so that's my why. I know this is a very long-winded answer, but it's really important to me. That's no. our whole entire business is structured around that. Yeah, I one of the. I mean, I named the podcast "Know Your Why." Obviously, it's important to me. But the <laughs> the interesting thing to me, I you know, over the time of having this show and and my own like real estate journey is is recognize I sometimes I joke that I should change it to the evolution of why in the in the the title of the mm. show because it yeah I talk to people and it, it's just like I said like anybody who's been doing it for you know sometimes more than a <laughs> more than a year like they things have shifted the, the reason why you start doing it versus why you continue doing it might be very different I think sometimes you have um, mm -hmm. for me it's been you know I, I didn't really call things I didn't call anything my why until what, five years ago. I didn't really know that was a thing. And so right. some of it's like, I look back and like, what was my why before I knew there was a why? Like what drove me in my earlier life? And certainly it's been evolutions, like you said, like with kids. And as my kids get older, it'll, that, you know, whole thing will, will shift. But um, so it's, it's, it's just, I, I, I really think it's an interesting I don't know, view into people's psyche as, as mm -hmm. far as, you know, the, the, the reason behind success. Cause it, it, it you're, you're, as you said before, like things are going to go wrong. It's going to be, there's going to be days when it's brutally hard and you're like, why am I doing this? But then <laughs> that's exactly why. Cause you have realized yeah. that 
you can, you know, go through your, your child's life and not miss anything. And that, that like, ultimately it's, it's about time more yeah. than, you know, more than money yeah. or anything like that. Money's the tool. But you're, <laughs> you're very insightful that you're right. It's the evolution of why I didn't think about the evolution. I mean, I, I kind of knew it, but I didn't, I mean, you're, you're probably right. That's a, probably a more appropriate name for the podcast because you're right. <laughs> yeah. Pre kids, it was all about me and my wife and having fun kids all about family the whole why changed yep. and now that they're grown the why is changed yet again that's really right. uh really interesting to now put that in perspective so interesting yeah. Yeah. so i'm not so new unique i know i think a lot of people probably tell you the same thing don't they i yeah i mean it's it, there there's often a lot of variations on family that's for sure for me it, you know that's a big part of it but i do i didn't mm -hmm. i didn't necessarily recognize that evolution piece of it mm. until I had the podcast and was talking to it. And it's yeah. like, because it just, it depends on, you know, when, when do you, what, at what life stage do you become an entrepreneur? Like maybe you're a, maybe you're young and you're like, my why is, is simply like someday I want to be rich or I don't want to work for anyone mm. else or whatever it is. Yeah. And then you're yeah. like, oh, I did it. I'm, I got successful. Now my why is like how, how much, you know, how many other people can I impact? Like with your, yeah. your teaching program, like there's just, it's just a, it's kind of a cool, I don't know, like <laughs> glimpse into the human psyche and, and what, you know, what mm -hmm. keeps people motivated. So um, I love, I obviously love, love the topic, love talking about it, but um, tell us something about yourself that uh, isn't common knowledge, special skill, a hobby, you know, something to let yeah. listeners know you a little better. Yeah, so I have had some unique hobbies. I've always felt like uh, my wife would always be like, Ken, what are you doing now, right? So I would come home one day and say, you know what? Uh, I want to learn to fly. You want to you wanna what? I said, I want to learn to fly an airplane. Well, when I was at Deloitte, the, the airport was literally half a block away. So I would go down at lunch and go fly airplanes, right? <laughs> and uh, so I, I learned to fly. I might, now, can you imagine a CPA? <laughs> leaving his office, going to fly right. airplanes. I mean, talk about like night and day. Um, so that is one thing. I'm a private pilot. I owned three Cessna pilot centers for a while. Um, actually bought it right before 9-11. That's a pretty unique thing, right? Taught me how to run a decentralized business in a really tough time, right? No question about that. And, uh, and then I learned to scuba dive, right? So you come home and I'm like, oh, this is what I want to do. And I've let's go scuba diving. So I learned to scuba dive. I just, I've always enjoyed learning things like that. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, learning to fly an airplane was tough because what no one knows about me is I'm blind in one eye. So now I had to get a pilot's license, but fly with a special medical examiner with the FAA to make sure I could see well enough to fly the airplane. Uh, so there you go. There's, there's my super top secret. Thanks. Um, uh, thing. But it doesn't affect. I was born that way, so it. it I don't even know the difference. Yeah. Don't don't tell your passengers that. That's the keys. Don't don't let anybody know. Oh, I don't uh, fly anymore. Fly no, I don't fly. Anymore. Yeah. No, I, don't do no, like, I got smart. I said enough of this risky stuff, man. No more. No right. more. Right. Um, when people hear this and they want to reach out, what what's the best way to to get in touch? Yeah, the best way is to go to our our uh, our website, kripartners dot com kripartners.com and when you get there you're going to kind of want to split yourself you either want to be passive or you want to do your own deals believe it or not most people do both yeah they start passive while they learn and then they sometimes they just they they do their own deals and passively invest but whichever direction you go we can help you that's what's important to me so it's kripartners.com and uh, then it's easy to find me there right um, it's my company so yeah well, fan, we'll we'll get all that in the show notes so people can see it. And I think it, it, it I, I love that you said that that it's kind of split. You know, you come into the website because I I think I have this like <laughs> theory that you know could, because because getting into real estate is like such a broad yeah topic overall. I think like really one of the very first questions people should ask themselves if they start to think about it is do I want to be active or do I want to be passive? And it's like, sometimes it makes sense to start as a passive investor and see how things go, especially if you want to be in real estate in the capacity of syndication or, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, yeah, vehicle you're, you're taking on investors. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. So I, I do. I think it's like, do, do you, I think most <clears throat> people understand that real estate is a good way to make money and like grow your wealth yeah. and, and have security in the long term. I don't think that a lot of people necessarily know that they don't have to do it actively to be in that, <laughs> to be in that space. So that that's a, a that's great, right. um, you know, kind of structure to, to the website is like, which, which do you think and, and where, where do you want to start? spend a lot of time first of all this question is the question everybody has to figure out mm -hmm. to get into real yeah. they know there's a lot of money there they're just they just don't know how to they don't know how, how do i do this like it, yeah first of all it seems just massive to them right i, I did a webinar a couple of weeks ago uh on a thursday night just talking about that what kind of self-doubt what kind of ridiculous you, you're not going to believe it, right? I never would have believed that I could own a $40 million apartment building. Like, are you crazy? There's no chance. Like, Ken, you need to go stop smoking stuff. Because yeah. it's not, I mean, you're just so far out in my field. That's what a lot of people deal with. So the point is that we go through that in our programs right away. Let's figure out what your goals are. Let's be honest about them. Let's do a real-time study. And wherever you land is fine, but we force them to go through that process. Because you need to, and most, most <clears throat> split, most do. That's what most people do. And then at some point they decide, nah, that this is just too much work. If I want to do it right, see, that's the thing. Once they know, they realize, man, I need to leave this to the professionals because there's a lot going. This is a business. It's yeah. not just a single family house where you, the tenant moves out every five years. You know what I mean? It, right. It's a real business. And so most people will, Go through those programs. And say, you know what? Uh, well, probably a half. About half of the people that start will say, you know what? I'm going to stick to the the passive side, mm -hmm. or they will do it and they will do it very slowly, which is probably the right thing to do, right? Don't quit your day job until right. you have enough money in yeah. the real estate. That's what I did, and that's what that's what a lot of people do as well. So, yeah, it, yeah. it is interesting watching them go through that process, though. Yeah, no, I, it, it is like more and more. I think about that with, you know, when people talk about getting into real estate investing, like you just, you got to decide, like, do you want that? Do you want that work responsibility and risk? Like, do you want all of those things? If you do, then great, be an active investor. And like you, you do have the potential to make more money as an active investor but it is active. It's, it's, so you're not like there's, it's active, there's risk. You're, you're, you're not a, you're not a limited partner. You're not, you know, devoid of the risk in these deals. Like there's just a lot of, uh, you know, things that I think maybe don't get thought of. Yeah. It's up to you. Now there is another thing that a lot of, remember I said, I started off with three buildings. I was still working at Deloitte. I did it on the side. Yeah. You could do that. And mm -hmm. literally bank all the money that you're doing on this real estate stuff and retire extremely wealthy. You could do that, right? You don't have to be all in, right? right. That's yep. what I love about real estate. You could buy yep. one building, run it for a while, sell it, use that money. You know what I mean? You could you could do this over a period of 20 years with one or two buildings and just make an insane amount of money. So there's a lot of options for people, and that's the important part, right? right. You don't have to jump in and make it your number one. I mean, it's my business, clearly. Right. That's the extreme. You could go call it part time uh, or you could just stay passive. That, that is what I like about it. And it, if if you let people realize you, you, you don't have to jump into this with both feet, you can do this slowly because they get nervous. They're like, man, well, I, what am I going to do? I can't quit my day job. That's not making any money. And I would tell them, don't quit your day job. No, that's not what you should do. Don't Let's do, do this slowly and get you ramped up because then you can make the jump safely if you even make it at all. Yeah, no, 100% agree. Um, Ken, this was this was really great. I, I uh, am so glad we got to have this conversation. I think people get a ton of value out of it. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, I, I do appreciate it very much. Yeah, me too. Folks listening, I, I know you're going to get uh, a ton of value here. Please connect with Ken. Um, he's got a lot to uh, a lot of experience and wisdom that, that you can learn from. Um, and please like and rate and review the show so we can get more great guests. Thank you all for listening. Hey there, I am Dr. Jason Ballara, and this is the Know Your Why podcast, where we explore the why behind success, 
Every week, I meet with real estate investors, veterinary entrepreneurs, mindset coaches, authors, and fitness professionals to uncover their why and how it drives them on the winding road to success. What is your why?